The next time you venture into the woods of eastern Arizona, listen closely and you just might hear it. The haunting howl of a Mexican wolf. Or a symphony of wolves, yips and yelps echoing across canyons, mountains and meadows in Arizona's Apache National Forest. So you see here... Uh, These sounds were recorded by Canadian scientists John and Mary Taberge. They've been studying wolves for decades, first in Canada, then Yellowstone Park, and more recently in East Central Arizona. Every year since 2010, they've spent about a month here recording the howls of Mexican wolves. We decided that we would look into wolf communication and see what wolves are trying to say to one another and in what context they're communicating with one another. Not too long ago, there were no wolves to record, no howls to hear. By the early 1970s, Mexican wolves were considered extirpated from their historic range in the southwestern United States, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They were erased from the landscape during the 19th and 20th centuries by ranchers, bounty hunters, and many others who participated in government-sponsored wolf eradication programs. We haven't had wolves for how long? You know, I've never seen one, you know, until now. I know my dad never saw one, but I know my grandpa and his, his dad did. You know, they were part of the people where they, you know, were paid to, to take them out, get rid of them. Out here, I just have, these are a lot of our uh, older cows. Kerry uh, Dobson is a fourth generation them. rancher who runs his cattle right in the heart of this country. Wolf country, <laughs> yes, I am right in the middle of it. Mexican wolves are a constant threat to his livestock, but they're also a protected endangered species. So Dobson finds himself in a peculiar spot. He's learning to live with a predator his predecessors were determined to live without. Mexican wolves, a subspecies of the gray wolf, were listed as an endangered species in 1976. Soon after that, the United States and Mexico started a captive breeding program by capturing the last Mexican wolves from the wild. There were only seven of them. Seven wolves from three lineages were all that stood in the way of extinction. During the next two decades, dozens of Mexican wolves were born in captivity, and in 1998, 11 of them were released into the wild. They were the first captive wolves let loose in the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area, 7,000 square miles in east central Arizona and west central New Mexico. This area, within the wolf's probable historic range, is where the Mexican wolf is making a comeback. The Mexican Wolf Reintroduction Project is a multi-agency effort that includes the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the White Mountain Apache Tribe. Those agencies are represented on an interagency field team, which is responsible for day-to-day on-the-ground management of Mexican wolves. This is the Hawk's Nest Alpha Male 1038. Jeff Dolphin is team leader for Arizona Game and Fish. He oversees a small group of biologists and technicians who spend their days keeping an eye on the wolves. So I'm pretty sure she was on this side, which makes sense. For most endangered species, that's about all the law allows. But these wolves are designated as a non-essential experimental population under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. That gives the interagency field team flexibility to take a more hands-on approach to managing these wolves. They capture and relocate wolves that have ventured into areas where they shouldn't be. They release captive wolves to replace those that are illegally shot. You know, hopefully you get the wolves walking this road and the bait is actually right back in here. Right here is where the actual trap is. Um, and these sticks are where the bait is. And they so trap again, wolves they and their pups so they can fit them with radio collars. 
When doing so, they take various measurements and record other important data. They also immunize the wolf against disease and draw blood to analyze for pathogens and genetics. Collaring the wolves allows team members to track their movements using radio telemetry. It also helps them keep wolves away from livestock. These Mexican wolves prefer to prey on elk, but they aren't always that choosy. Right behind us, right here. This is where they were killed, right here. Dobson says wolves killed two of his calves last April. So far, he's had just those two depredations in 2014. Last year, he had 12 confirmed kills, and since 2002, Dobson says wolves have taken more than 60 of his animals. I mean, I'm losing livestock left and right. I need some help. I need some, something has to change. A federal trust fund is available to reimburse ranchers for livestock lost to wolves, $200 to $3,000, depending on the type of animal. They do pay for our, our confirmed kills. But then, like I said, that we still we have to move pastures. We ha and a lot of that sometimes uh, we have to use trucks. Dobson says moving his cattle out of an area when wolves move in takes time and money. What we have to do on our permits is you have to go up, maintain the fences, maintain the waters, get them all prepared for when you put the cattle in there. We get them in there. Wolf dens there. Now we have to move to another spot that we were going to rest or leave alone. We'll have to go in there, maintain those fences, make, get, make sure there's waters. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. As you can see, I have the flagery around the top edges of our fences here. Um, these are, I put that up for the elk to keep them out during uh, our cabin seasons. For the wolves, we'll put it down lower. Um, we get it about three to four foot off the off the ground to where it's able to wave with electricity and it works pretty good to keep the wolves out. If it was my way, I wouldn't have had them here, but it's not up to me, they're here. And you know, it's up to the federal government to help us out. Early on, Dobson felt like the reintroduction project didn't care about his concerns and the relationship was contentious. The first couple of years, it was, I, I didn't trust anybody because the stuff that was going on was just not right. And there was no communication whatsoever. It was all hush hush. You know, don't tell the ranchers where the wolves are. You know, you, you can't do that to us. You know, and um, it, it just wasn't working. It wasn't working at all. Maybe let's think about adjusting what we got. But in recent years, he says Jeff Dolphin and the interagency field team have helped him quite a bit. Oh yes, yeah, Jeff, like I said, I get calls from him. Two, two, sometimes two to three times a week, locating, let me know where they're at. Everybody, I mean, like I said, it's been really good. And I think that buys a little, a lot of credibility for us on our side when, when we're responsive and, and, and listen to them and, and try and find solutions. So we're good now. Dolphin says it's important to have the support of people who live, work, and play on this land. Without it, the wolves are in a precarious position. From 1998 to 2013, 55 Mexican wolves were illegally killed. There have been plenty of setbacks and challenges, but 2014 has been a positive year. It's been very good this year for the wolves. Uh, it looks like we have documented 40 pups produced in the wild, which is more than it's ever been produced in the wild in the history of the project. 2014 was also the first time the field team attempted to cross foster wolf pups with a wild surrogate pack, and the experiment was successful. Since 2010, almost all of the wolves in the recovery area are wild-born, and they seem to be doing better than their captive-bred relatives. They're surviving on their own. They're not needing help to survive from us. There's less nuisance behavior from them. They're doing what we want them to do, but we're really seeing a, a dramatic incline in the population right now. When the reintroduction project started in 1998, the goal was a self-sustaining population of at least 100 wolves by 2006. That timeline didn't work out, but the number is now in reach. We'll probably break 100 this year. There's 18 packs right now. We may have 21 packs by the end of January. 
these are these are big events that have happened this year that have that are really looking good for the project in the future. It's a future where wolves regain their rightful place in nature, where rewards are offered instead of bounties, and where the howl of the wolf is a sound of success. We humans have done a lot of things, you know, wrong with conservation, but this is a this is a right, and, and uh, to, to know that wolf howls can rebound from rim rock to rim rock once again makes this a really special place. It really touches something within the soul.